Good evening, friends. Before our evening plenary speaker tonight, I'd like to introduce Barry Krasno, the General Secretary of Friends General Conference, who would like to say a few words about FGC. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> These words are going to be more about FGC as a community, as, as all of us, as the Religious Society of Friends. And I just want to start by saying one of the great joys of what I do is once a year getting to see all of you and see all the love and the deep fellowship. It's, uh, it's just extraordinary joy for me. For what reason I know not, the Divine Spirit comes to me in worship, in dreams, and sometimes through visions and words that I know come from a place beyond me. As sometimes challenging as it is beautiful, I know God has called me, at least partially, onto the mystic's path. Just before Christmas, many years ago, I was driving to work in Taos, New Mexico. It was a very ordinary moment when suddenly I was overtaken by a vision. Up until then, it was only the second time in my life that something like that had happened. It was so powerful that I had to pull the car over to the side of the road. In this vision, I very unfortunately saw all sorts of violence happening all across the world. It was like a montage of movie stills that I couldn't turn off. I began to feel deeply ill, and in that moment, I heard a voice cry out, enough, enough. And with that, the vision was over. However, I knew that the violence that I had seen was not. The soul of our shared being, that which connects us all, that divinity that dwells within us, was crying out for the violence to end. And now, in the wake of Orlando, of Charleston, of Paris, of Istanbul, and too many places to count, our souls cry out even louder for that violence to end. But what, God, what am I to do, I would ask, in that time so many years ago? And now I ask, what are we to do? How can we bring about a world where the fullness of our humanity, where the wonder of our existence can be nurtured and celebrated? For some time after that vision, I prayed and meditated, frequently looking for an answer. Then one day, while working at my desk, I felt suddenly the inbreaking of God. I heard clearly the words, Quakerism is a doorway through which many will walk. With those words came a deep knowing that extended beyond the words themselves. I knew then the road I must follow, and in my heart I surrendered to that truth. If Quaker faith and practices are a doorway through which many will walk, then the doors must be wide, the doors must be visible, and the doors must be open, open for all who seek healing, community, and transcendence. This is what I was called to do, and I would do it until I was released. Now you might be asking yourself, what does the first vision have to do with the second? It's my experience, the world that we co-create is constructed from our beliefs. Violence, the will to dominate, and the fear that often creates them comes not only from our experiences, 
They come from what we believe about our experiences and what we teach others to believe about our experiences. My experience is that sharing and living Quaker faith and practice can be a very real and powerful tool for interrupting the violence and cultural dominance that diminishes and ends so many lives. Now, I know many of you may be thinking, as Quakers, we don't often get it completely right. We've seen here this very week how, within our own faith community, even with good intentions, how we allow ourselves to be a reflection of the dominant culture sometimes. We know that we have work to do to become the beloved community, the community that our hearts desire to experience. In my mind, what's key is that we know we have work to do. Contrast this to aspects of the dominant culture in which we live and in many parts of our global society that actively espouse hatred and violence. People who sometimes misuse religion as a tool to spread fear and violence in an effort to dominate, oppress, and gain power. Interrupt this misuse of spirituality. Share with the world what we know to be true, that when we listen to the divine and to each other, we progress, we heal, we grow. We become reflections of the divine love that the mystics and sages from many religions throughout many ages have all said is our true nature. My plea to you is to empower and support emotionally, spiritually, financially, facilitators and teachers of Quaker faith and practice. Support outreach and those who are called to do outreach. Pray on whether you are called to teach or do outreach. Not to convert, but to simply show that there is a door which is available to those who seek. Know that we need not be perfect to invite people to walk this journey with us. We are all together in this, as a community, as FGC, even in all of our imperfections, and even with all the changes that FGC as an institution is going through. I believe one of the most authentic things we can do is humbly admit that we are all on a journey that's messy, that's imperfect, and then surrender into that knowledge and be faithful to our call. Remember, too, that in forgiving ourselves and forgiving each other for our imperfections, while also seeking progress in love, there is liberation and release. Interrupt the cycle of violence by sharing what is powerful in our tradition with others. Stand up to the dominant culture that has often misused religion by standing with our peace-seeking brothers and sisters from many faith traditions and no faith traditions at all from all over the world. Say clearly to anyone who will listen, there is the seed of God in every one. We live strongly in the knowledge of the full equality of men, women, and all races. We seek a world free of war. We seek a world with equality and justice for all. We seek a world where every person's potential is nurtured and fulfilled. Last but not least, we seek an earth restored. Be bold. While we may worship in silence, let there be no doubt that in this time of violence and darkness, we are called to let our life speak and our voices to be heard. Good evening, friends. My name is Lois Yellow Thunder, and I will give you the plan for this evening for Rex's talk, Living in Dark Times. At the end of Rex's talk, there will be no applause. There will be a time for silent worship with no verbal ministry. I will then end 
by giving people freedom to rise. The sheets of paper that you were handed have quotes from William Penn that Rex will refer to in his talk. And if you have questions of Rex, he will be giving a talk on his book, The Quaker Way, and this will be on Thursday at the bookstore at 3.15. And if you will bring the questions that you have, that you can write, if you wish, on the back of that sheet, then he will be happy to engage in dialogue with you and your questions. Also, Rex will be here throughout the gathering. On Tuesday night, we will have a special well, interest group, and that interest group will be for those who are interested in forming an experiment with light network in the United States. There's already a network in Britain. On Thursday, as mentioned, Rex will be giving the author talk. And on Friday at 1.30, Rex will do a two-part program. The first part to explain the Quaker practice experiment with light, and the second half to practice the experiment with light. Rex Ambler's life and experience reflect the theme of this gathering. Be humble, be faithful, be bold. Rex is a British friend, formerly a lecturer in theology for 30 years at Birmingham University. Some years ago, Rex began his own spiritual exploration. Rex discusses, discusses what questions motivated this exploration in his book, Light to Live By, an Exploration in Quaker Spirituality. He asked, what did the early Quakers experience when they talked of the light within them that showed them the way, the truth that set them free? the life which sprang up within them and between them, and the power which enabled them to do the seemingly impossible. This was also an inward and humbling quest Rex undertook, since he was looking for his own truth as well. The result, after studying early Quaker texts, including George Fox's writings, which resulted in Rex's book, Truth of the Heart, an anthology of George Fox, was to realize that early Quakers did not have a creed, but a practice. This practice, described by Rex as the experiment with light, is based on early Quaker practices. Currently, Rex writes on Quaker faith and practice and travels widely to teach the experiment with light. His latest writing is on Quaker faith, the light within, then and now, Pendle Hill Pamphlet 425, and the Quaker way, a rediscovery. Just as early Quakers turned the light of truth on themselves, they were emboldened to carry this truth into their relationship with the world of which they were a part. Rex's bold early efforts were directed toward national and world affairs and are reflected in two of his books, Agenda for Prophets Toward a Political Theology for Britain and Global Theology, The Meaning of Faith in the present world crisis. In 1987, Rex ran for parliament as a Green Party candidate. He represented Britain Yearly Meeting at the 1989 European Ecumenical Assembly, whose theme was justice, peace, and the integrity of creation. 
As we listen to Rex's thoughts on living in dark times, the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2, come to mind as both a challenge and a comfort. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Good evening, friends. And thank you, Lois, for that generous introduction. Um, it's quite clear that I'm a Brit, isn't it? <laughs> Visiting America on, of all days, July the 4th. <laughs> uh, is that all right with you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought I'd better check it out. <laughs> So, you have my theme, <coughs> living in dark times, which may seem like a dark theme indeed, but I hope, as we progress anyway, we will find some light at the end. It's more like an exploration of the darkness till we can see through it to the light on the far side. Friends today are facing a new challenge in the world, I think. For a very long time, perhaps for a century, we've been able to rely upon the support of many other people, many other traditions across the country, across the Western world, to support our own concerns, as they too are committed <coughs> to justice and freedom. And this has been a very important part of our identity, in fact, part of what it is to be Quaker, that we are aligned in some way with other progressive and liberal forces. But now things are changing. The world is changing. And that confidence that we can make a new world, that things are going our way, that we will overcome, is beginning to get thin and uncertain. In fact, the we're becoming aware that there are very large forces in the world at large which are getting bigger and stronger and seem to have their own momentum. I mean things like climate change, uh, the increasing gap between the rich and the poor, um, the migration, especially from the Middle East and the inherent conflict between the Middle East and the West. How are these things going to end. What, what of anything we do can give us the confidence that this will somehow make a long-term difference? I think this is a crisis for friends. It certainly is for me and for many other people who've, who've thought about it. Um, <clears throat> and one of the most immediate facts is that an awful lot of people are now suffering from poverty, inequality, marginalization, from violent wars, from the ecological danger and degradation, not just from climate change, but from all sorts of other um, ecological facts, is making not only life very difficult for many millions of people, but making the outlook even darker. So dark times does seem to be unfortunately, a good description of where we are and where we're moving. We've had dark times before, but maybe not in our memory. I don't know. There was indeed World War, which concluded in uh, 1945. And interestingly, that has impressed, that impressed me because I was born just before the war broke out. So I was born into a war situation. And that has coloured my outlook. As if dark times is kind of normal. And I wondered, 
you know, in these happier days since, when I was going to wake up and see the darkness again. But actually, it was a great joy when I was a young lad, growing up in the 50s, and realizing the world was actually changing. And more than that, that it was becoming open to the kind of change it needed. So in the 60s and 70s, it looked really as if the world could move towards greater freedom and justice and harmony and cooperation. And we could be part of it, and I could be part of it. And indeed, these changes happened, and we were part of it, and I was part of it. Until around 1980, if you remember, when things began to switch back, and the changes slowed down, even to the extent that they then began to reverse. And many of those changes have now been completely undone. That is why it feels to me strangely familiar to have that kind of conflict. I, w I was brought up in South East London, so you can imagine I was at the centre of what there was of a German invasion. I experienced a lot of bombing and destruction, people killed, fathers and brothers away from home. It was a very big surprise when they all not all came back. Many of them came back and we started to live a normal life. So I've had to ask myself what is happening to this world really? What is going on deep down underneath? And that seemed to actually coincide with questions I was asking about myself. When relationships didn't work out, when my marriage broke down, for example, um, what was happening that I should be taken by surprise and found myself doing things I didn't want to do, saying things I didn't want to say? Was there some connection between those two things? Because one of the things I've noticed about the time in which we live is that we don't really understand what is going on, what is behind, within, these deep and powerful changes. There are a lot of things we can say about them. People, for example, are very committed now, more than they have been before, to the acquisition of wealth. And we have mechanisms through the international market, especially, of generating huge amounts of wealth, extracting huge amounts of resources from the earth and from labor across the world. And this has been successful enough to bewitch people into thinking this indeed is what life is for. But we know it's very costly too. I experienced this deep dilemma only recently. You may have noticed just ten days ago there was a referendum held in Britain. You did notice. I, I, I even saw it, yes, it was the front page of the New York Times when I arrived at the airport. Um, I was impressed by that. You may well have a better understanding of what the referendum was about than most people in Britain. Because this was one of the puzzles about the whole thing. Everybody knew this was a very important decision we were going to have to make. Perhaps the most important decision in our lifetimes, or at least for a generation. Were we or were we not to stay within the European Union? And the European Union had been set up in the 50s in the aftermath of that war, that world war I was talking about, in order to prevent such a thing happening again. It was a peace project, essentially. And the nations that had been at war were actually cooperating together through trade, especially to building up their various broken economies so that we would have no good reason to go to war. And this extraordinary project has worked. For those 60 years, the members of the, Un the European Union have not been in conflict with one another. But at some point in that process, was it in the 70s? I'm not sure. It must have been felt that the, the peace element had been established and that the means to producing it, which was making money through opening up the market between us, was now the important thing. 
So the peace project became a capitalist project and a very successful one. But at the same time, it's been a very costly one. Those countries that didn't have such financial and other resources to begin with have found themselves in great debt as the economy has grown. So most of southern Europe has been not only impoverished but deeply threatened in its financial system by the, uh, the market that's been driving us all. Um, and many people from those countries have therefore migrated. After all, free movement of people is essential for a free market. That's part of the capitalist project. So, although it's successful in one way, in others it causes great cost. And I think now there's actually a conflict between those who are looking to Europe to make money and those who are frightened about Europe because they're losing their security. That's people who are having to move out of their country because they can't find decent work or they're not safe. And for those people in the countries where they're moving to because they feel threatened by the inrush of competitive labor. That's the crisis. But do you know very little of this was actually discussed in the referendum itself? You probably picked it up. What happened was that that open, important discussion about our future in Europe turned into a battle between those who said we should stay in and those who said we should stay out. They both fought furiously, totally denying the arguments on the other side, nobody attempting any way to look at the whole picture, the balance of forces, the balance of good and bad within the Union, and so most people decided at some point they didn't know really what was going to be best for us so they would they would choose the people that they liked. I don't know, is this familiar to American politics? <laughs> it's very sad, isn't it, that democracy seems to have come down to voting people for people you like that touch some some need within you, but don't actually address the situation you're in, the, the problems that we have to talk about and determine together. So this is why I'm, I'm talking about dark times. I feel we in Britain are walking blindly into disaster. But more importantly, I feel we don't know quite where we're going or why. And lots of Journalists are saying this as well. That is a new kind of world, isn't it? Well, one of the things I have discovered in my studies of politics as well as religion, because I, I rather combined them in my academic work, was that at bottom I didn't really understand either of them. There is something deeply mysterious in the way people behave especially when they behave en masse. And if they align themselves to some very clear philosophy or ideology, if they have leaders who can articulate well what it is they're about, then their actual motives are even more mysterious because you know there's a growing gap between what people say and what actually happens. Talking of which, I came across a very inter interesting discussion between your president and Marilyn Robinson. I don't know if anybody else came across this. It, um, it appeared in the New York Review of Books last autumn, and apparently Barack Obama had gone to Iowa to meet this well-known novelist, Marilyn Robinson, because he's, he was very interested in the way she described the basic ethos of American people. And of course, knowing I was coming here, I was very eager to read about this. And they both talked, they had this conversation which was recorded, and apparently you can see it on YouTube, um, as well as in, I think, the October edition of the New York Review of Books last year. The actual debate was discussion was recorded, and they agreed that there was a kind of homespun morality which had developed in America and had been a backbone to um, life in America up till now. 
and especially a supportive basis for democracy. And this they both described, I think, if I remember rightly, as neighborliness, based on the experience of neighborhoods where people knew they had to support one another in order to survive. Um, and so the individual was encouraged to pursue his or her own life, but always with a thought to the needs of others. There was a sense of the common good. Um, and the need for some humility, not too much brashness, not too much selfishness. You didn't develop your career or make money at the cost of other people. Of course, many people did, in fact, but that's what a lot of the literature is about. Many of the films are about this. Um, that was going against the code. But now they both said, Robinson and Obama, that that code no longer seems to be holding in the public sphere. That respect for the other, concern for the common good, for a sense, a natural sense of equality is distinct from a legal equality, seems to be fading. And Obama in particular talked about a growing gap between the way people live in their homes and their communities and the way they behave on the large scale, the national scale. These are two different things, and he sees they're both puzzles as to why this happened, you see, and that, that impressed me. Even Obama can say, you know, I don't know what's going on in my own country here, yeah? and they're both alarmed about it. He praises Robinson for having so written so well in her novels. Um, they weren't entitled to a decent living, and so on. This was a kind of um, construction or invention, as they put it, to make themselves comfortable with the things which they had, you know, grasped hold of for their security. That's what he means, I think, by Bedlam. He's not too hard on them, though. It's as if he can look at all this with the perspective of a doctor and say, yes, we're living in a hospital of mad people, so it's our job to look after these people and teach them some sense. And I think that book, Some Fruits of Solitude, could be read in that way. It's giving advice in which people can help to come to themselves, know they who they are, and therefore um, recover reality and sanity. <clears throat> Now the second piece is actually written for his children. They were grown up at this time. Um, but he's saying similar things, giving them some general advice about to order, how to order their day. I suppose the sort of thing a father likes to tell his growing children. And you can hear them yawning and um, uh, muttering quietly as he does so. But it's very interesting what he thought a good day would be. For example, the day starts and ends with meditation. That's what he calls it. Or retirement, which was another word for it. That is, to be still and silent. And he suggests they do that before they do anything else, before they get dressed or have breakfast. And at last thing at night, when they're in bed, before they actually... <clears throat> lie down, they become still and silent and allow themselves to become aware of the day as a whole of the life they lived and to absorb what's going on. I'll read it. And you can imagine, can't you, now, William Penn sitting up in his bed, bolt upright, beside his wife, Guglielma, both with their nightgowns and caps on, dead still and silent, waiting until they're moved to go to sleep or to get up. And he, at this paragraph, he's suggesting that if they're, even if they're reading a book, they should not get too involved in the content of the book, be carried away by it. They should be aware of themselves reading it. Interesting. Rather meditate than read much. For the spirit of the man knows the things of a man. So that's my comment, a quotation from Paul the Apostle. 
And with that spirit, by observation of the tempers and actions of men you see in the world, and looking into your own spirit and meditating thereupon, you will have a deep and strong judgment of men and things. For from what may be and should be, and what is most probable or likely to be, you may hardly miss in your judgment of human affairs. So you'll be able to work out not only what is going on, what but ought to be going on, and what might alternatively be going on. That's a pretty broad awareness. And note how this contrasts at every point to what it said before about the world. This is precisely what the world could not do, is see things and judge, make a sound judgment of other people and themselves. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, you could hardly miss of your judgment of human affairs. And you have a better spirit than your own in reserve for a time of need to pass the final judgment in important matters. He's making um, a contrast there between your spirit and a spirit that is better than your own. He quotes Paul and says, the spirit of a man knows the things of a man, which I take to mean, as Paul meant, the Apostle Paul, that <clears throat> you know very well what's going on inside you. You know your own thoughts and feelings. So pay attention to them. The least thing you can do is to set time apart during the course of the day when you stop thinking and planning and arguing and just notice where you are. Fox says that at one time. Let the man feel how he is. Let the man feel how he is. And Penn is saying, yes, you, you already know enough for that basic situation. But when it comes to the really important matters, his last phrase, you need something better than your normal consciousness, your normal awareness. And the reason seems to be that the really important things in life go very deep. They're not matters of fact which you can look at out there. You can't work out intellectually or by observation in that sense um, what's going on. Even when you look at yourself, as he says, um, looking at your own spirit, you will find there are all sorts of thoughts and feelings inside you that warn you against looking at certain things and steer you towards looking at other things. You will develop what we call an image of yourself, a self-image. And they, they talked about um, the self and um, the consciousness of self or the righteousness of self. How we each want to think of ourselves as all right, acceptable, righteous in the sight of God. And so we manipulate our stories and our images in order to make that right. But as a result, of course, we obscure the actual reality. And I think that actually was the fundamental insight of those early Quakers. They saw through not only theology and church liturgy and all the doctrines that were formally taught, but they saw through the way people spoke about themselves and the way they tried to persuade others to think of themselves. They tried to see things as they were because they found a spirit in them better than their own spirit in time of need. And that I take to be a special piece of advice to us in time of need. There's a kind of retirement and silence that we need that goes beyond just thinking about ourselves and our situation. That is, I think, clearly indicated there by Penn when you're in need in, and something really important is facing you, you have to stop and step aside a little and allow something else in you to inform you what is going on. Because your anxiety of yourself, your sense of yourself, your need to justify yourself, all these things, these the activities of the self, as they would say, or the ego, as we might say, will get in the way of any sound judgment as to what you are doing on anybody else doing. And if you do not understand yourself and what makes you tick inside, what motivates you and, and um, makes you do the things you do, if you're not aware of that going on, you're not going to be aware 
of what other people are doing. Those two things are very connected. Um, notice line two. Two ways in which you can get understanding of human beings. By observation of the tempers, that's the, um, the character or the, um, uh, what's the modern translation for that? The, the kind of disposition, the mood, um, and actions of men that you see in the world, and looking into your own spirit and meditating thereupon. Those two things have to go together. Observation of other people and observation of oneself, but without oneself getting in the way. And how is that possible? Well, only if there is something deep within us which will enable us to see. Only if there is some sort of a consciousness deep down, a kind of awareness which can see us whole, truthfully, without prejudice. And the early Quakers didn't know there was such a thing until they actually experimented with it. Which is why Fox said in that you know, famous passage of his in the journal when he first really became convinced, he'd given up on what everybody else had said and suggested to him. Um, and he said, and then, oh then, I heard a voice which said there is one, even Christ Jesus, that can speak to thy condition. And then he goes on, when I heard this, my heart did leap for joy. Jesus Christ enlightens and gives faith, grace, and power. This I knew experimentally. That means not only by experience, it means as in the new experimental science of that time, being tested by experience. So, this I knew experimentally means I knew this to be true because I had experienced it myself. I had tested it. And he tested that he was enlightened and given faith, grace and power. The things that he really needed because that's what he lacked. But first of all, enlightened. He began to become aware of himself. So the light within that Fox and the early Quakers talked about, I don't know why we've forgotten this so easily over the years, the light within is something deep within us which enables us to see. It's not something ahead of us that inspires us on. Um, it's not a disclosure of some other reality. It's a source of insight that enables us to see who we are and where we are. It lights up our life. So then we know who we are and what to do and so on. Anyway, I'm, I'm perhaps saying a bit too much of that, filling out. Let me take you to this last quotation, because you will see why this particular quotation impressed me so much. <clears throat> I had been asking for a long time, reading Fox and others, how did they then switch from this kind of meditative approach to life, which led them to gather together in silence in meetings, into making strong acts of protest on demonstration. Why did they want to impact and press the world so much? How and why did these testimonies evolve? Because other religious groups, particularly mystically oriented groups, weren't really con that concerned on the whole to ch change the world or make an impression on it. Well, here is um, here's quite a telltale statement. In this passage from The Rise and Progress of the People Called Quakers, which was originally Penn's preface to Fox's journal, 1694, he's explaining to the general reader, again, that these activities of the Quakers, which seem to have got them a bad name, talking people to people crudely as if they were all equal, uh, not showing special respect for their superiors, um, demanding that wealth be shared more readily, that people stop fighting. These outrageous things, Penn says, were not intended to you know, stir up trouble. They're not simply a, a protest against the government because we don't like it. No, he says, the reason they behave like this, and here comes his reason, but God 
having given them a sight of themselves, they saw the whole world in the same glass of truth and sensibly discerned the passions and affections of men and the rise and tendency of things. That glass of truth, yep, a looking glass, we don't use the word now, it's a mirror. So here it is a mirror, metaphor, a mirror of truth. God has given everybody a mirror. If they want to know the truth, there you have it. You look at the mirror, my God, you see yourself. That is the big, you know, Quaker convincement, you see. That's what I am, yes? Is that really what I am? And if you recognize that and accept it, you can then, he's implying, you turn the mirror slightly and you can then see the world. My God, yes! That's what's really going on in the world. I can discern the passions and affections of men. What they're really thinking and feeling beneath this surface, beneath this rhetoric, beneath all the things they do and pretend they are. And the reason they can do that is because they have recognized those things in themselves. That, that, that's the, the rub. And in a way, what I'm suggesting, I suppose, to you this evening is that we, we rediscover that early Quaker practice. It's not very comfortable, at least not this part of it. Because if you, it's saying to you, if you want to understand the darkness of the world, you have first of all to understand the darkness in yourself. And you've got to look at the things you don't like, you don't approve. I mean, there is a flip side to it, but this may not be evident. Because at this point, that might seem like um, just adding, you know, coals to the fire. But there is, in fact, a flip side to this. If you look at yourself as you really are, and accepting yourself, then something in you comes to life. What you have, by denying who you really are, you're actually denying all sorts of possibilities and potentialities within yourself. This is what they call the seed, the seed of God held down underneath the hard earth which can't penetrate until the sun breaks out. Or at least that's one way in which the metaphor is used. Once the light appears, then we see our, our new possibilities. And also we can see how that kind of recognition enables us to do things in the world that we couldn't otherwise because we've touched firm ground. Okay, we've discovered there are dark things in us and there are dark things in the world, but we now understand actually what's going on. That's a huge step forward. And that's something that everybody can access. They all have this capacity because this is part of the experiment. People try it out and find yes, when they're still and silent and stop thinking and arguing and imagining and simply look, they will see something in them comes to life when they stop all these things, when they stop and step aside a little, as Penn nicely puts it. Then they can see that's already a great liberation. So out of this, of course, came a great vision of how the world itself could be changed. You communicate to the world how it really is. Whether they like it or not, they may not like it because nobody likes facing the truth head on if they're already committed to some kind of image or story about themselves. And who isn't? And yet, the truth is the best thing they could ever get hold of. So friends' testimonies were basically testimonies to reality. They're not testimonies to values. That's how that word has come to mean for us, I think. Not inappropriately, we can bear witness to what we believe in. But the original sense of testimony was much more like what a testimony would be in a court of law. 
you know, the, the role of a testimony because we give it this absurd preface. I don't, do you do this in America? You make someone swear with a hand on the Bible? You do. I know, it's something that we Quakers have refused to do. Yeah. Because we are committed to truth as such, period. No qualifications, no special vows, and certainly not... You see, putting your hand on the Bible, it says, it's really saying, God strike me dead if I tell a lie. Um, it's, a, it's a huge superstition invested in that. But the court has to do that because the testimony of the people who were there is absolutely vital for the court to come to a sound judgment. The judge doesn't know what happened. And maybe the prosecutor and the defense don't fully know what happened. They all depend on what people say on the basis of their experience. So that's written into our constitution and there are similar things in, in the modern science. Uh, the testimony, which was used a great deal at that time in science, that a researcher would give their testimony as to what they had seen and done, and that would be trusted by the community in a rather solemn way. And that is still true. Scientists knew, need to trust each other, and the court needs to depend on the witness. And the friends were saying, we can testify to the reality of grace, uh, and liberation and enlightenment because we've experienced it for ourselves. We can't prove it. Um, we have no arguments to demonstrate it. We're not going to appeal to the Bible um, as if that were to decide the matter. It will no doubt, you know, correspond with what the Bible says because the Bible is a sound test in me to what they experienced. And we're echoing that. This is our testimony, it means this is the truth as we know it. Right, now, before we get there, because I think this is an, going to be very important for our own understanding of how we engage more deeply with the world, let's look at this process. Uh, how much time have I got? I've got about ten minutes left. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. Yeah, I'm, I always talk too much and then leave the best parts out, I'm sure. But I've, I've, said, I've said quite a bit about how this could apply to us today. Um, this advice of Penn. Um, and I think the three bits of advice are, if I, I'd summarize it straight away, are get back to reality, mind the oneness, a well-known Quaker, phrase at that time and trust the light this this deep resource that you have which is not your normal thinking mind and I think those describe three phases of a meditative process which they called waiting in the light which would lead eventually of course to living and acting in a certain way but this meditative process uh, need, needs to be understood. I was very impressed by what I read in Penn to try out for myself just what this would be like, stepping aside a little to look, simply look at the world and look at myself, alternately as it were. How do I correlate what's going on there with what's going on here? Um, I'd learnt that practice basically from George Fox. He says a lot about it in, in a rather obscure way, admittedly, but I managed to track down all the clear statements and put them together. And um, that helped me to see the process that Fox is talking about. And what this involves is what we today would call a meditative process in which you come to understand yourself better. He doesn't use the word well, it's, it's a Latin or French word, meditation. Um, wasn't used much, much among the common people. William Penn uses it, you notice. He's recommending specifically that people meditate on themselves, no less, and then on, on the world. But this practice is, proved to be much more 
focused and profound um, and disciplined than anything I had experienced up to that point among Quakers. The meeting for worship was in a way meditative, but it was open and free. There's no implied discipline there. Um, any thoughts and images may come, um, and you allow to happen what happens. But what Fox recommends, and then Penn as well, is a much more precise attention. First of all, you give attention to what is troubling your conscience. Look to the light in your consciences, they would say. All of them. Um, that meant, if I understand it rightly, that you go quiet and still, first of all. This is to enable you physically to stop the normal ego activity of thinking and imagining, planning, remembering. You're going to, not coming blank, you're not going blank, you're just freeing yourself from those activities so that you can give real attention. And what you give attention to is anything that's on your conscience, that anything that tells you this, something here not right, something that doesn't feel right, or perhaps something that really does re require something very good, something really important that needs attention then you open yourself to that reality. Then the light in your conscience shows you what that reality is. So the discipline is to not argue, not be waylaid, don't find any excuses or um, comparisons, whatever. Simply give attention to what is happening in your life. And you have to start there as we said, because you can't really recognize what's going on with other people until you've seen this kind of process in yourself. And then you'll discover, yes, that you're not at all a person you thought you were. Uh, and that is the surprise convincement. And I tried this once, I'll give you one example, I've, writ I've written about this, but I think it it helps you to see what a delight this was to me. I, very early on, when I was trying out Fox's practice, <coughs> I was reflecting on a relationship that was going rather badly wrong. I knew already that um, I was making matters worse uh, by not telling this good woman what I actually felt and thought. I assumed that to speak my mind openly would only make matters worse. Um, you might already have seen the stupidity of that ruse, but I wasn't quite bright enough at that point. So I meditated on this because we were having, we were getting on well, and then there were fearful disagreements and rows. And I waited in the silence, and I stopped thinking about it, and I just gave attention to this relation, what goes on between us. What is going on between us? Look, watch, listen. And then two words came to me out of nowhere, apparently. Be real. Yes, I knew it immediately. That told me what I'd been doing wrong and how I'd messed things up and how I could now put things right. I was real. I don't mean I just blurted out what I thought. I paid more attention to what I actually felt to start with. That was a new thing. And then I communicated that in a way that I felt was sensitive. And the relationship became more real. Actually it happened she didn't like it, but here we are. <laughs> um, I now tried this more widely, a year or two later, in, in, in a political situation. Yeah, I, I, I'd visited Israel and Palestine and uh, like many people who visit Israel and Palestine I was shocked by what I saw and heard what's the matter with these people I was saying to myself why don't they listen why don't they talk so I meditated on it and I realized that the basic problem I had the basic problem in this situation was my preconception of it There's a great history here, it dawned on me, 
There's a great deal of insecurity. People are worried about how they're going to survive at all. What do I know about that? I was silent. Silent. And I had other meditations which made me realize that when I thought about political situations or things where place, situations where I might help and do something, you know, political or otherwise, I was actually quite preoccupied with my own issues of security. Am I going to be accepted if I do this kind of thing? How will this make me feel if I take an initiative here? Um, am I with a group of people that I actually admire and respect? What has this got to do with dealing with the issue that concerns me? It's all getting in the way. And I began to become aware of other things getting in the way, like for example, the things I read to or saw or watched to inform me about what was going on in a situation. I meditated on that and became aware that even the best journalists have their own agendas, that editors of newspapers, um, like me, they have their own idealism about the world, they need to project a good image which shapes the policy, the image of the paper or the program on telly. Why don't I take account of all that when I'm absorbing the apparent facts of the situation? So I began to see myself in a hall of mirrors, both about myself and others. What can you trust in all this? I then remembered some words of Mahatma Gandhi, who I'd studied a great deal, but that was incidental, because I was actually talking with a woman, back in the 80s this was, um, who as a young woman had worked with Gandhi in the 1930s. And she told me this story. Gandhi said to her, I'm very troubled about what's happening in Palestine. Um, 1930s, so that's before um, Israel declared its independence as a state. Um, I'm very troubled, and people have been asking my advice. They're wondering if my non-violent techniques would help. Um, but he said to Dorothy, um, I, I can't entirely trust what I read in the papers, so I can't give any advice. Will you go to Palestine and tell me what's going on there? And that, she said, is what she did. And Gandhi formed his understanding of it. And I, I learned from that. You see, that direct experience is important even in political situations. Getting a feel, meeting the people involved, knowing what's going on, seeing the affections, like the, and the, the rise and tendency of things, getting a feel for what's really going on. Now, we may be getting into deep water here because, indeed, this is a bit alarming. And I was alarmed to think that I'm living in a hall of mirrors. This was, I suppose, my equivalent to William Penn's bedlam. Here I was looking at images of images of images and wasn't sure quite where the reality was. So this is another phase in which we look more closely at what is really going on. And I'll tell you uh, another meditation I have which I think helps to see where there can be a turnaround and what seems like an increasingly dark and difficult picture becomes hopeful. Um, like many of you, I imagine, I was very upset by the political response to the attack on the Twin Towers. I was upset by the attack on the Twin Towers, Twin Towers as well, of course. Um, but I was also upset by the response because it seemed to me the leaders involved on both sides of the Atlantic were not actually asking seriously why this had happened. No, what these people meant by this atrocity what it was coming from and what it was meant to achieve. Why the Twin Towers in particular? Why this particular mode of uh, aggression? Instead, it was seen as a declaration of war against the West and called for immediate response, which was a war on terror. 
So without further ado, the war was initiated. And I was appalled at this. I thought, what do they think they're doing, these leaders? They are making trouble. So I meditated on this. And what came to me, I said, what's really going on? What's really going on here? And the answer came, what's really going on here, Rex, is that you are demonizing the Western leaders and treating them exactly as you see them treating Muslims. Yeah. What I am accusing them of is exactly what I was doing in my protest against the Western leaders. Secondly, that's only the first thing. Secondly, you are supposing that this situation you want to stand, want to understand is outside of you, detached from you. It's something you might be able to intervene in. Maybe you could join a protest, write an article, set up a discussion group between Christians and Christians and Muslims. Things I did do actually. Um, but that was misconstruing the situation. What came to me is that you are not actually apart from that conflict situation, you are in it, you are part of it, you're projecting onto them things about yourself that you do not like. You do not like the fact that you are judgmental about political leaders, that you divide people into the good and the bad, the winners and the losers, and so you project that onto other people. Look what they're doing. Now this may sound like a bit of modern psychology to you, but what came to me was some words of George Fox. I hope I've got time to read these. And I've still not got to the end of what I was saying. Um, this comes from the journal, fairly early on in the journal, and it's one of his openings. Do you remember how he describes various moments in his early life when he suddenly understands what's going on. He would say, ah, I could see these priests, that they think that studying in Oxford and Cambridge qualifies them to be a minister of God. Of course it doesn't, of course it doesn't. It's a pretense. And now here's something else about the priests and their people. This was his general word for all ministers of the church. <clears throat> I saw the state of those, both priests and people, who in reading the scriptures cry out much against Cain, Esau, Judas, and other wicked men of former times, but do not see the nature of Cain, Esau, and Judas, and those others, in themselves. These said, it was they, 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 that were the bad people, putting it off for themselves. And when some of them came with the light and spirit of truth to see into themselves, then they came to say, I, I, it is I myself that have been the Ishmael, the Esau, etc. When these who were so much taken up with finding fault with others and thought themselves clear from these things came to look into themselves and with the light of Christ thoroughly to search themselves, they might see enough of this in themselves. Then the cry would be not, it is he or they, but I and we are found in these conditions. Extraordinary, isn't that? And so that's what I did. I looked into myself and saw the nature of Bush and Blair and the others who'd started a war in the Middle East in myself. And that was dark and that was difficult. I no longer had an excuse, I no longer had a nice but for my criticisms, I had to face the fact of the way I myself judge people and polarize. But, and this is the turning point, um, I wish I had done myself more time to talk about this. I found, and this is also there in the early Quakers, it's also the point of joy with all of them. When I looked at myself, saw myself as I was, and accepted that, when I owned the truth, as they would put it, immediately I felt differently about the situation. Accepting 
what had happened or what was happening, I felt myself accepted. Embracing the whole reality, I felt myself embraced. This is what they meant by the grace of God being manifest as the truth is owned. And as the grace of God is manifest, you then experience yourself because you are accepting. I, I can't really say understand this. I, I'm sure it's deeply mysterious, but there's something that I sense about it. When you really accept life, reality as it is, reality accepts you. It's like, you know, you've come home. You've found your feet on the ground. So you've let yourself relax. You've given up all your attempts to elevate yourself and you've allowed yourself to drop and you land firmly on your feet. And with that reality, you get a new sense of yourself. You are not alone. This sense of being part of the problem turns round into being part of the world itself. This whole remarkable creative process that we belong to and which we don't really understand except when we objectify it as something out there. But this ongoing reality that is life, the universe, we're all a part of, equally. And so, wherever we are, we're in the world. Whatever we're doing, we're having an impact. We can't influence the world because we're it. I'm not a, we're not apart from the world, we are the world. So whatever we do, we're experiencing and participating in it. So the question then comes, how do we live so as to honour that fact? How do we experience that fact more fully so we can enjoy it, that we are part of this totality, that we embrace by it all, that we somehow matter, and, and that we can actually enrich it, bring more peace, more depth, more clarity, more light. And that's the bit I've not left myself time to expatiate, but I will say briefly, no, it is, it is important. Uh, this last phase also means letting go of that confidence we put in our own reason and capacity to act and influence. We've got, in a sense, let go that liberal agenda which has been such a support and support for us for many years. We can do those things. I'm not saying we get stop campaigning and organizing and publicizing, but we've got to get back to step aside a little and find some firmer ground, some reality that we belong to and we can know and know for ourselves. And when we do that, then we can engage more creatively with the world. So Penn's advice, step aside a little. Stop what you're doing and step aside. Retire from the world is intended so that we can re-engage with it much more fruitfully and creatively. You know this other quotation from Penn, I'm sure. <clears throat> True godliness don't turn men out of the world, but enables them, enables them to live better in it and excites their endeavours to mend it. So you can see where that comes from now, can't you? This deeper awareness of what the world is. It is not just a madhouse. This is a, a world which has lost a sense of itself, but what it is, is a remarkable creation of life and being that we're part of, so we can cherish it and must. And we will, because, interestingly, I haven't talked about that emotional level to it much, but it's a very important part of it. What I was describing earlier, about distancing ourselves from the world and wanting to prove ourselves valuable by influencing it arises very much from fear and distrust and need to prove ourselves or to make ourselves safe. But if we experience ourselves as actually embraced by the world, embraced by God, the source, the ultimate reality in and behind it all, then we don't need to prove anything. We don't do need to do anything to make ourselves secure. We have found our feet and we feel 
at one with the world. So the natural feeling to rise towards others is then affection, love, care, interest, curiosity. The fear and the anxiety drop away because the separation is gone. And I think this is what Woolman, David, uh, John Woolman meant when he said love was the first motion. He wasn't talking about an ideal of love that he was trying to put into practice. He was talking about a real motivation that surged up within him, which came from his silent meditations. He had a real feeling for the poor, for animals, for the world about him, and he responded. And that is, I think, the basis then of Quaker action. It's not a general appeal to values, not even great values like love and peace. It is a response to the world as we ourselves experience it. We can't, of course, know the whole world. That is a mysterious thing. If we can call it a thing at all, it's, it's a great mystery that hovers around us. But we know this world, and if our eyes are open, and if we have the light of God within us to disclose where we are, we have at least this patch of light in front of us that enables us to live and live well. I had a, an image of that a little while ago when I was meditating in the middle of the night. I do sometimes because I wake up in the middle of the night, as old men do, and I thought, yeah, I'll meditate. So I sat in my room looking out into the pitch darkness of the wood. And on this particular night, just a few nights ago actually, I saw some strange little pin lights bobbing up and down, getting bigger, coming towards me. And I kind of focused on this, disregarding entirely what Fox said I should be doing. <laughs> what is going on out there? And then I realized that these were people walking in the dark wood. It couldn't have been darker. And those little lights but were actually lamps attached to their heads. These people had taken the reckless step of actually walking through a dark wood in pitch darkness with a mere lamp. And it came to me sitting there in the meditation. That's what we all have to do now. In this dark world, we have to make sure our lights are switched on and focused and we know where we're going. And the impact of that will be that we ourselves will become more real, like I was told to be. Um, that we will live our lives in as testimonies, living testimonies, to what human life is. And people will be affected by this. If they sense that we are being real, we're treating them as real, if we're being honest and open and we actually care about them without some ulterior regard for ourselves, they will be moved. Or they might be horrified, they may think, uh uh, don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> and that's often how, but some may be touched. And that's what the testimonies are really doing. They're bearing witness to what people already know deep down, because they all have this light of God in them, whether they know it or not. So what we're doing is acting out, in a way, what they know. And this will set up a resonance within them. Remember Fox's famous phrase, um, to, to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of God in everyone. You see, that answering is like echoing, like bouncing back. And they will feel in themselves, maybe in a way they can't articulate, this is what it's about, isn't it? It's something about this. Their conscience, of course, will then come to life and maybe they will then attend a meeting or just go silent and think what is this feeling I have that life is not about me as um, Richard Raw nicely put it um, I am about life that's a nice night turning and bearing witness to that truth will have an effect that no, no one can calculate and we certainly can't produce results that then could serve as evidence for this particular way of dealing with the world's problems. Um, that makes it difficult. 
And in addition to that, um, people don't like the idea this is going to take away our control of the situation, our analysis, our understanding of how it all works, our proposals, our rational mastery of the world. Because that's surely one of the things that is actually part of the darkness we inhabit, this desperate struggle of humans to master the world and control it for their own benefit. And maybe the crisis we're entering, the darkness we're entering, will be a, a wake-up call to see that life is about something else. We don't know. We have to trust that hidden process within human beings which actually brought us to some enlightenment too. And trust that that too will work with them. We're going to go against the grain, we're going to be unpopular if we do this, but that's where we're called to be. To be humble, to be faithful, to be bold.